Okay, so um, first of all, thanks again for doing this. And I just wanted to ask you, I've, I've read up a, a bit on uh, the film and on you, but I just so I know the answers to a lot of these questions, but I'd love to be able to share it with people in your own words. So where were you born and raised? Um, I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. Yeah, so I'm just like, you know, from the suburbs. It's like a small suburb called Antioch, Tennessee. Okay, and uh, did you go to the movies a lot as a kid? And if you did, were there any favorites or influences for you? Um, I did, yeah, but when I was a kid, like, I liked, like, the big tentpole stuff. So, like, Indiana Jones was, like, a big deal when I was a kid. Like, E.T., mm -hmm. so, like, I'm, I'm, like, a child of the 80s. Yes. Um, but um, I, I like to read, probably, sure. more than I went to movies, so. Yeah. Um, and when did you first sort of try filmmaking and then when did you first know that it was something you were actually going to be in for for the long haul? Yeah, I kind of came to film like really like late in life. It was like my second career. I started out, I got my MBA, went to business school, you know, and, and, and was working in corporate America like selling uh, wart remover basically, <laughs> you know, and then like, you know, gradually came to figure out that my life had to have something more to it. And, yeah. um, so I think I was like 20... 627 when I quit my job with the film school. Wow. And um, so this is like my second life and I've been much more fulfilled since wow. then. Um, so my understanding is that it was while working with Spike Lee that you first had the idea of a pariah. And so if you can just explain how even that fate, you know, that relationship came about and then how it sort of formulated out as a film in your mind. Sure. I, I'm, I started writing pariahs coming through my own, I was going through my own coming out process at the time. And I just recently come out. Mm. My parents, you know, had tried to have like an intervention where they, you know, weren't, in, you know, they weren't in, in agreement. Mm. And so like it was a tough time. And so I was kind of like writing the script as kind of like a catharsis to what I was going through. And, mm -hmm. um, actually, and so at the time I was going to NYU's film school and I was interning on Spike Lee's from Inside Man. So just like on lunch breaks, you know, I'd be on set like writing my script, and you know, it was just great to be in that environment and see him work and. I was actually interning with the script supervisor, so it's great because you're right next to monitor and mm -hmm. you're getting to like see how you know all the departments interact, and you're getting a chance to talk to all the departments, you know, get, get their feedback mm -hmm. and notes and stuff. So it was a great place to be on set, just to learn from him like how to run a set, how to mm -hmm. you know interact with actors and crew. So um, it was like really you know educational in in in, the, in that way. And then also he teaches master classes at, at NYU, so he would have office hours. I sign up every week and find something to, to talk about because wow. you know, half of them are going to get in a room with Spike Lee. Yeah, so right. Really, it was just kind of like blown away to just be able to learn from him in that way. Wow. Um, so why the name Alike? Uh, Alike is a Nigerian name that means girl who drives out beautiful women. Okay. And so I like that name because in a way she kind of drives out Bina and, and, and then, you know, she's this person who's, you know, she's coming into herself, but she's a catalyst for kind of those around her. She kind of drives out, drives Laura to be her better self and, um, you know, although she starts out kind of being kind of like a referee, kind of like a protector of her family, wanting her family to stay, to stay together, ultimately kind of she's the thing that, that kind of is going to help them make that next leap to openness and, and, and truthfulness with each other. And as far as the title Pariah, it was, um, I mean, it's obvious why she might be considered that, but I think it's it meant more to you than just referring to her, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically, I think all the characters in the film are prized in different ways. So the mother, Audrey, for example, she's just lonely, you know, her core is loneliness. She's just a woman who wants to connect. Like, nobody ever, like, physically touches her during the movie, almost, like, except for, like, one scene. And so she's feeling very kind of isolated, you know, she's kind of socially awkward at work, you know, at home, husband's kind of dismissive, so she's feeling like a pariah. Arthur's a pariah in that, you know, he, you know, his peer group expect him to be a certain kind of dad, and he's not willing to be that, you know, he loves his daughter unconditionally, and is not kind of wanting to bend to, like, what should be. He wants to keep things as mm -hmm. they are. And then Liga's a pariah because she doesn't feel like she quite fits in the gay world, and she doesn't fit in the straight world, so she feels like she, she doesn't quite have a place. And I guess in some ways Lara's a pariah because she, you know, you know, you know, she's had to fend for herself at a younger age and, you know, has made some choices that has limited how far she can go at this point when we meet her in the story and is realizing that she has to kind of free herself by, by going further and reaching higher. So everybody, in a way, feels isolated. Yeah. Um, to, to what extent, I know you mentioned that you were coming out at the time that you were thinking about this for the first time, but is the story itself, to what extent is it autobiographical and, and just maybe to whatever extent you're comfortable, maybe you can describe your own experience going through what this character goes through of sort of discovering, acknowledging, and then having to disclose this to her family. Yeah, it's my autobiographical, you know, not in terms of like the world, because I'm from the South, I'm from like 
rural sub suburb. I'm like a nerdy chick, like from from the suburbs, <laughs> and like the league is like you know a, a nerdy Brooklynite, I right, guess. Right, so right. like there's that there's that <laughs> similarity. But um, it's similar autobiographical in that like when it came out, my parents weren't you know happy with it, and they flew to New York to try to have intervention, and we went through this kind of difficult time where we weren't speaking to each other at mm -hmm. all, and then we did start talking to each other again. You know, it was by omission, like and I basically be omitting like large parts of my life because I couldn't really you know tell them what was going on with me, and so it's like it's kind of like you know, unspoken, don't, don't ask, don't tell kind of thing mm -hmm. going on. And in that same way, you know, in the Gates family, every, like everybody knows what's going on, but everybody's kind of pretending like not to know and kind of tiptoeing around mm -hmm. it. And so in that way, um, I projected some of, some, some of my experience onto what the Gates going on to. And then also the other element that I'd say is kind of semi-autobiographical is that when I did come out, you know, I came out like late in life, I was 27, so, mm -hmm. you know, I was living independently and, you know, you know, had means, but still, you know, when I would go to the gay clubs, I wouldn't feel like I fit in, like I feel like I wasn't hard enough to be really butch, I wasn't really soft enough to be femme, so I kind of felt in invisible and elite gay and that somebody feels invisible and kind of unsure of herself. And, um, you know, she comes to realize that she can be, she doesn't have to check a box, she can be who she is, and that's... And the, the, the same kind of thing I was coming to learn that I don't have to check a box, I can just be as I am. It doesn't, you know, oh. mean anything. I have to live up to anybody's labels or, or expectations of me. This is a, a question I want to be careful about how I word because I feel like it's almost not my place to raise it, but it's come up in other interviews that I've done where just two two quotes that have thought that occurred to me when I was watching this film again. Mm -hmm. The first was when I interviewed Viola Davis about doubt. And we were talking about the fact that here's a mother who, in that case, uh, would rather allow her son to potentially mm -hmm. uh, go through what he's going through with mm -hmm. this priest than, than acknowledge the possibility that he's gay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the second one was an interview that I did with Michael Kenneth Williams from The Wire where he was saying that uh, he feels that slavery, in a way, robbed a lot of uh, black people of their, African Americans, I should say, of their... Uh, ability to communicate in the way that they otherwise would have been able to. Mm -hmm. And so I, watching these, I, I can't make the generalization any more than somebody could make a generalization about, you know, white people. It would be, it would mm -hmm. be but it does occur to me that the people in this film have a very hard time communicating with each other. And that's whether it's parent to parent, kid to kid, parent to kid, um, there's sort of difficulty doing that. And I wonder if you think that First of all, is that a, a correct interpretation? And then also, do you think that uh, homophobia is more or less, you know, is to a greater degree uh, a, a, a pariah issue in the black community than it would be elsewhere? Um, so it's just a second question. I do think that uh, homophobia is probably still more of an issue in communities of color mm -hmm. just because it's more of a taboo and it's just a different cultural reference point. So I feel like from that standpoint, yes, you know, like people, you know, making the, some people feel like, oh, is this really still an issue? And like, yeah, it is, you know, and even if it's, you know, even if you take away the racial aspect of it, you know, and in rural communities or southern communities or communities that aren't, you know, New York or LA, you know, it's still like, it's, yeah. st it's still an issue because it's about like, what's the, what's the accepted norm? And so I feel like, yeah, it's still more of an issue for a lot of youth and, you know, I was hoping that this film would help LGBT youth, youth of color have, you know, another rep reference point to look at and know that, you know, it's okay to themselves. And as far as the first question, um, the, yeah, each of the characters is kind of isolated, you know, by this kind of self-imposed kind of like, you know, not being willing to say what's really on their mind. But I think that's real life. People don't really say exactly what's on their mind. They talk around it. Like, they don't say, I love you. They say, I like your jacket, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think, you know, I wanted to have those characters kind of have that same kind of struggle where everybody kind of knows everything, but everybody kind of pretends to, like not to know, mm -hmm. you know? like. Laura has a crush on Alike, which is kind of like known, but it's kind of under the surface, but she doesn't speak it until like close to the end. Mm -hmm. and, like, you know, we know, like, Alike knows that her father, you know, is maybe doing some stuff on the side, but she doesn't want to say it, and he knows that she's gay, but he doesn't want to say it. It's mm -hmm. kind of like this idea that as long as it's not spoken, mm -hmm. we're safe, that we're okay, we, like, you know, we can maintain the status quo. And um, so I just wanted it to, to be like a story of like, you know, unspoken truths, and it's like about the lines that are in between the lines, and things that are unsaid. And, you know, try to say things with like a look or like a, or like a, or like a non-look or like mm -hmm. a gesture, just kind of the things that everybody knows but is afraid to speak. And Elike finally comes to the fact that she has to like speak up for herself and be herself. Um, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, it was 
I guess, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but it was originally written as a feature, yes. then made as a short, exactly, yeah. then made into the feature. So can exactly, you yeah. connect the dots of how that happened? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Because, um, people assume because the short film was produced first, it was a short that evolved. But actually, I first wrote the feature back in 2005. It was a 140-page monster. It was ridiculous. But I was kind of like the first just like letting out of the story. Right. And uh, at the time, I was finishing up NYU's film school, and, and I needed a thesis film to graduate. So I took the first stack from the feature, which is like the first like, 30 pages. And, um, yeah, 30, 40 pages. Well, like, we, we cut it down to 30, mm -hmm. but the first 30 pages and, you know, shot that. And it was really great because it helped us to workshop the material. And then also kind of like the second effect was it gave us this kind of like selling piece. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we did start fundraising in earnest for the feature, like, we had a short to show them. And, you know, we had, like, this kind of festival track record. Mm -hmm. And it was actually making the short that got the attention of the Sundance Institute which, in, you know, then we were invited up for the Screenwriters Lab in 07, and then, then the Director's Lab in 08, and then the Keys of Cooper, the producer, actually, actually did the Producer's Lab, mm -hmm. like the first Producer's Lab, I think, also in, 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 in 08. So it really kind of gave us, like, a jumping-off point, and, you know, where people would read the script and not see how the story could be universal. They could watch the short and feel like, okay, I absolutely felt that, and, like, mm -hmm. I can identify with that. And, and the thread, I guess, that, that um, one of the threads that unites the short with the feature is obviously... Adapero, or Adap I want to make sure I say Adapero, it right, yeah. Adapero. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about, first of all, how you first encountered her, mm -hmm. and also if it was always clear that she would be there for the feature as well. Yeah, definitely. She came in, so Adapero came in when we were doing auditions for the short film, mm -hmm. and we just posted character breakdowns, I think on Breakdown Express, and she found a way to submit herself, and submitted herself, and came in the first day, and just blew it away, like she was it, she came in. You know, you can almost tell like if an actor's right as soon as they walk in the door, and she came in, didn't like really like say a lot. I was almost like looking off, mm -hmm. and she was using a costume, and she really just embodied the character and like was not a stereotype and mm -hmm. was nuanced, and you know, you really felt her. And so it was clear that she was going to be in the feature. She and also Pernell Walker, who plays the best friend character Laura, mm -hmm. and also uh, Sarah Mullis, who plays Sharonda. So like those are kind of like our like must haves. Like not going to waver on those mm -hmm. because they had the characters, right. and they had the chemistry together on screen, which was important. And um, so the hardest part in casting the feature was finding the parents because we wanted to present, you know, different parents, mm -hmm. you know, not the typical angry black mom mm -hmm. or, the, or the, you know, distant black dad. Mm -hmm. Like we wanted to show like a present family, a middle class family that had other layers going on to it versus, you know, what you expected. And so um, Kim Waynes came in and it was a surprise. Like we weren't, you know, she showed us an Audrey we'd never seen before, but she was instantly like the best mm -hmm. one. Like she showed us an Audrey that had vulnerability. And uh, same thing with Charles Parnell, who plays Arthur. You know, here's a dad who's, like, strong but has a sensitivity. Like, we needed to believe that he was strong, but also that he loved his daughter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to show he's kind of like, you know, a guy from, like, around the block, like, knows community, but also, you know, um, takes a different approach mm -hmm. you know, to, 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 to parenting. Than well, I hope I can close with two quick questions. And just, uh, first of all, um, the, I, the issue of fundraising mm -hmm. uh, without, you know, especially on a, a first uh, feature narrative film not I know you made a documentary but um, how brutal was it I heard that at one point well and, and maybe you can confirm this but that financing was not necessarily there even during the filmmaking and that you guys literally sold your apartment to contribute towards it so can you how how hard was it yeah, it was like the hardest part of the process is getting the money because people would read the script and say it was good, but, you know, no one's going to come see this. And so we sold, Nikisa and I sold our apartment because, you know, we figured we have to invest in ourselves and how can we ask other people to take a leap of faith if we can't take the same mm -hmm. leap? So it was kind of like our last kind of like, you know, um, like that was like both feet in, like we believe in the story. And, um, you know, it was scary at the time, but, you know, we believed in it. And, um, and in terms of getting others to invest, you know, we found people who basically believed in the story itself and, you know, didn't care whether it made a dime back and people who just really, you know, feel like this story has to be told. And there came a point, like, I think July of 09, where we had to, like, stop production because we had some of the money, but not all of it. And, you know, you know, we had to walk away from, from bad money, which was, you know, even harder than finding mm -hmm. good money. It's like saying, like, you know, I can't take this check because, you know, you're not going to be a good influence mm -hmm. in the film. So, like, that was hard. And we had to, you know tell crew, you know what, like, we're, we're pushing, you know, so that was, like, a hard decision to make, but ultimately the right one, and, oh, sorry. No, no, please. Sure. Oh, I was going to say, the financing. Oh, yeah, in, the, in December, so, like, our, our, our kind of second investors that came through, like, Sundial Pictures, they really came through, like, I think, like, the last day of shooting, and so it was literally kind of, like, a last minute, kind of save wow. the day, Hail Mary thing, but, um, but, yeah, but, again, they're the investors who believed in us, let us have creative control. And, and just gave us the freedom to, to explore the material, which, which is great. They were the perfect partners to, to be with them. So the last question is, the film now 
you, you I, I don't know which number trip this was back to Sundance, but this was probably the one that's going to stand out most in your memory when yeah. in January, I guess, of this year, it uh, is finally seen the feature by people. It yeah. generated very strong reactions, positive reactions. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about what you've made of the reaction there and since and this idea that now people on on mass are finally going to uh, see what you've been working on since 06, I guess? Yeah, well, it feels good. I mean, it feels, I mean, my, my biggest concern was like the audience reaction mm -hmm. and, you know, just understanding that it's subjective and, you know, some people are going to love it, some people are going to hate it, most people will be like in the middle and just kind of like it, you mm -hmm. know? So, I mean, that was like the most nerve-wracking thing, but uh, from, from the reaction, just a validation that this is a universal concept. Everybody can relate to stories about identity and not checking a box, so it was a, a validation of that and the thing that we knew throughout, and it was great to be able to put forth a story with characters that we loved and believed in and not having to compromise who they were and what this, the story was about, so it's a great feeling, you know, I still have butterflies going before a Toronto audience because, right. you know, again, it's subjective, you never know what's going to come of it, but um, I think I put more, not, yeah, I, I think I really feed off the audience's love and so it's great when people like it and, you know, the thing that you thought was true was true, so. Well, congratulations and thanks a lot, I appreciate it.